we welcome you to this time of worship and praise on the campus of New Orleans Baptist Theological Seminary. Our days are always filled with many things to do, but every Tuesday and Thursday we take this time to come apart and to worship our Lord and to hear from Him and from His Word as He speaks to our hearts. Dr. Steve Horn is our pastor for the day. He's the pastor of First Baptist Church of Lafayette. What can you say about Steve Horn? First of all, the word Louisiana, because he is a true Louisiana boy. This is where he's lived his life. Secondly, he is a pastor. He has pastored several different kinds of churches, and he's taken on one of the pastor's greatest challenges ever, and that is following a successful legendary pastor because uh, his successor, his predecessor at First Baptist Lafayette was one of the most famous pastors in the history of Baptist work in Louisiana. And he was there for years and years. Actually, he was the Pope of Lafayette, more so than the Catholic priest. And yet Steve has come in after that wonderful ministry and carved out a terrific ministry of his own. He's the pastor. He's the leader. And he's done such a great job of doing the work of a pastor in that place and keeping the greatness of First Baptist Lafayette going into the next generation. We're grateful for that. He's also a servant. He has served on many different denominational committees. He's one of our trustees now. He's done about everything there is to do, including president of the Louisiana Baptist Convention here in this state. This is a man who loves Jesus, loves the preaching of the word, and we're going to have a great sermon from him in just a moment. Our scripture reading this morning is Proverbs chapter 3, starting in verse 1. This is the word of the Lord. My son, don't forget my teaching, but let your heart keep my commands, for they will bring you many days of full life and well-being. Never let loyalty and faithfulness leave you. Tie them around your neck. Write them on the tablet of your heart. Then you will find favor and high regard in the sight of God and man. Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and do not rely on your own understanding. Think about him in all your ways, and he will guide you on the right paths. Don't consider yourself to be wise. Fear the Lord and turn away from evil. This will be healing for your body and strengthening for your bones. Honor the Lord with your possessions and with the first produce of your entire harvest. Then the barns will be completely filled and your vats will overflow with new wine. Do not despise the Lord's instruction, my son, and do not loathe his discipline. For the Lord disciplines the one he loves, just as a father, the son he delights in. Thanks be to God for his word. I am... uh find myself when I'm on this campus being somewhat envious of all of you. Got here early this morning, uh, making sure that with traffic between here and Lafayette that I would be, you know, you don't always have to be on time, but when you're preaching, you've got to be on time, right? And so I was here early and um, went to the library and just uh, being in that reference room with all of those books surrounding me made me a little envious of all of you, that you get to have those books by you every single day. Now, you may not feel like that this morning, but let me tell you, you will feel like that one day. Precious memories of this seminary and my days here in this chapel uh, where uh, many days the Lord met me here in this chapel. I pray it will be the same for all of us this morning. Would you take your copy of God's Word, if you have it, and turn with me to the letter called Philippians in our New Testaments. And I want to draw your attention to Philippians chapter 1 this morning. I'm going to read in verses 21 through the end of the chapter. If you have your Bible, I would ask that you keep your Bibles open. We're going to glance back uh, at some of the reading of text before we get to my reading of verse uh, 21. I routinely tell people when asked, what is, uh, and they ask me, what is your favorite book of the Bible? I routinely answer the book that I'm preaching from. That tends to be my favorite text of Scripture. And second place, I tell them, is Philippians. And so you're getting the double barrel today. I'm preaching from both my uh, favorite and second most favorite book of the Bible. 
in Philippians. I think one of the reasons that it's my favorite is because it's short, and so it fits my attention span uh, on those days that my attention may be going in various places. But it also is a favorite of mine because of this ongoing theme of rejoicing and joy and Certainly that is relevant to Paul's circumstances because it is clear that he is in prison, literally and uh, maybe even we could say figuratively because of the chains of the gospel and because of the imprisonment that that is, uh, has been causing him in these days leading up to his literal imprisonment. And yet... He can speak to us regarding joy, and he can challenge the church even in the midst of those present circumstances. So I want to talk to you today using this text of Scripture, taking this ancient text, but praying that the ancient text becomes the living words of God for us and challenge us here as we begin a new year as we begin a new semester, to pursue Christ. Because I think that beyond the joy, Paul has realized that his joy has come in pursuing Christ. And that's my challenge for you, and really my challenge to myself, that in all things we will pursue him. The Bible says in Philippians chapter 1, verse 21 and following, you're familiar with these words, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. And now if I live on in the flesh, this means fruitful work for me. And I don't know which one I should choose. I'm torn between the two. I long to depart and be with Christ, which is far better, but to remain in the flesh is more necessary for your sake. And since I am persuaded of this, I know that I will remain and continue with all of you for your progress and joy in the faith, so that because of my coming to you again, your boasting in Christ Jesus may abound. But here's what I want to call your attention to. It's in the next phrase, verse 27, just one thing. Those words capture my attention. I I like it when I hear someone say, Just this one thing. I want you to focus on just one thing here. As citizens of heaven, live your life worthy of the gospel of Christ. And then whether I come and see you or am absent, I will hear about you that you are standing firm in one spirit, in one accord, contending together for the faith of the gospel, not being frightened in any way by your opponents. This is a sign of destruction for them but of your salvation, and this is from God. For it has been granted to you on Christ's behalf not only to believe in him, but also to suffer for him, since you are engaged in the same struggle that you saw I had and now hear that I have. We are all pursuing something or someone. We are all pursuing something or someone in this life. If you don't believe me or you are struggling as to what it is that you might be pursuing, let me just engage you with a couple of diagnostic questions here as we get into this text. First of all, I think we we can uh, learn what we are pursuing in life when we consider how we spend our time. What are we doing? That tells us oftentimes what we are pursuing. Check our calendar, we could say. Where do we spend our time and where do we spend our money might be a second question that we ask. And and where we spend our money might tell us what it is in life that we are pursuing. Maybe a third diagnostic question could be, what do I, I find myself thinking about? What, what is it that consumes my thinking, and very often times that will tell us what we're pursuing in this life. I have, uh, for about um, 15, 16 months now, been leading our church to pray each week 
for one thing. And so it appears in all of our media and our worship bulletin on Sunday, and I typically uh, at least one time a week will blog about this and encourage all of our Sunday school classes when they meet, all of our fellowship groups when they meet, that in the midst of all of their other prayer concerns, that as a church, we will pray about, and we call it, this one thing. So we've been doing that for about 16 months. By by the way, I've asked our church this week in light of uh, of the uh, Sanctity of Life Week that that our this one thing this week is, and this is the way I worded it, that we'll pray boldly for the ceasing of abortions in these United States. I got to tell you, this is off the subject, and I'm going to get back to this text, but it's like a punch in the gut yesterday when uh, when we're praying that this week, and then we read of legislation in New York that is advancing the cause of abortion and even the celebration of that. But we're going to keep at it. We're going to keep praying, right? And you're, you are as well. But this idea of this one thing, which we've been thinking and talking about this for 16 months or so, that's why my interest is captured when we come to this phrase, just, just one thing. Again, there there is something helpful and meaningful about being able to focus. Now, in the original language, it is just one word here. It is a word that probably would usually get translated only. It's the idea of only. Some translations give it the idea of only and always. Uh, Again, all all of that is this connotation of zero in on this one matter. Make it your life focus. That's why later in chapter 3, Paul would be able to say, I press on to the call, to the goal, the high calling that I have in Jesus Christ. I make it my aim. I pursue it. Pursue Christ. Something helpful, I think, about pursuing one thing in life. When we baptize in our church, uh, I have a, a team of helpers that help the candidates uh, uh, get ready, get robed, and uh, as I'm getting ready myself, then they're giving some preliminary instructions to the candidate. We want that to be beautiful and meaningful, and so we instruct them on how to stand, how to fold their arms, and and, and, to, and to bend their knees to give a little help to the pastor here about all, all, all of this. And, uh, and, and so I, I usually go into that room and uh, say, y'all have gone over some instructions. And I, I will reiterate and be, begin to talk to them about some of those same, same issues. And every once in a while, I'll see this sort of glassy o- overlook look of the candidate. As if to tell me, I didn't know it was going to be this hard. I didn't know I was going to have to remember so much. And, in the, and when I see that look, I always say, and if you forget all that, don't worry about it. I'll take care of everything. And George, he's one of my helpers. George always says, he ain't lost one yet. I'm not exactly sure that's what I want George to say, but that's what George always says. Just one thing is the idea of this text. So what is that one idea? To live your lives worthy of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Christ is worthy, isn't he? He is worth it to live our lives in full surrender, in full pursuit of this calling that we have in Christ. Begs the question, and we find it here in the text, why? Why? Our English translations give us this idea, or as I've read, as citizens of heaven. Again, in the original language, uh, literally the idea of, of heaven doesn't appear, but there is the sense that they are citizens of the gospel. They are Uh, citizens of the kingdom of God and certainly being citizens of the gospel, citizens of the kingdom of God uh, would reflect this idea that we are citizens not of of a city, not of a state, not of a, a national power, but we are citizens ultimately of heaven, right? 
Eugene Peterson, who, as probably you know, author of The Message, passed away last in 2018. He wrote it in these terms. We are people who spend our lives going somewhere, going to heaven, whose path for getting there is the way, capital W, Jesus Christ. We realize that this world is not our home and set out for the Father's house. And so once we've realized that, once we've realized that we are citizens of heaven, once we have realized that we are citizens of the kingdom of God, we ought to live like that, right? We ought to live now like we are citizens of there. But again, it begs the question, so what is that? What does it mean to live our lives worthy of the gospel of Christ? Well, let's glance back at this text just uh, just a moment because I think that there are some context clues here in Paul's introduction that help us to identify uh, what it is that he is talking about when he gets to this one thing. First of all, that is reflected in Paul's prayer for them. Did you glance back at uh, chapter 1, verses 9, and 10, and 11? And this occurs in Ephesians, this occurs in Colossians, it occurs in uh, 1 Thessalonians, many of Paul's letters where there is some prayer blessing to those to whom he is writing. And it is here in Philippians that he begins this letter, and I pray, I'm in verse 9, and I pray this, That your love will keep on growing in knowledge and every kind of discernment. So that you may approve the things that are superior and may be pure and blameless in the day of Christ. Fill with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. The walk worthy of the gospel of Christ is reflected, I think, in that prayer. Because to live worthy of the gospel of Christ is for our love to keep on growing, right? It is for us to have discernment in in every kind of decision of life. It is to approve the things that are superior and pure and blameless until the day of Christ. To live our lives worthy of the gospel of Christ is to always be filled with the fruit of the Spirit, the fruit of righteousness that comes only through Jesus Christ, our Lord, to the glory of God. So if we're looking for some kind of hidden meaning of of, of what it is to live our lives for the glory of the gospel, for the gospel of Jesus Christ, we, we really need look no further than the very prayer that Paul is praying for these precious saints, his friends in Philippi. But secondly, we'll also observe in this text that to live our lives worthy of the gospel is reflected in Paul's testimony to them. So after he prays for them in verses 9 through 11, he begins to share with them his own personal testimony of what God has been doing in his life in these most recent days. And and really, Paul points to two things that are linked together by one common thread, and it's the gospel. First of all, Paul's testimony is that he's in chains for the gospel. He's in prison, but, but Paul says, don't worry, don't fear. I'm rejoicing in these chains because these chains have given me a strategic contact for the gospel. Others are hearing the gospel because of my chains. Others are growing outside In the church, they're growing in their courage because of their knowledge of seeing me in my chains for the gospel. That's Paul's testimony. That's what it means to live our lives worthy of gospel. Be gospel-driven, to be gospel-centered, to want the world to know, even if it means being in prison, even if it means being in suffering, even if it means something against our circumstances. And then as you continue in this passage, you'll recognize something else of his testimony. 
And that is he's given thanks for those who preach even deceptively. Those who preach in pretense. Now, I have an idea that Paul would rather that they preach in truth. Make no mistake about that. But he says, of those who preach in that way, that at least Christ is being preached. And he rejoices in that. And I just got to tell you that I struggle at that area. And I know people are preaching out of selfish ambition, out of pretense. And yet Paul says, I'm going to rejoice in it. That's what it means to live in pursuit of Christ, to live our lives worthy. Paul's ultimate testimony is uh, for me to live as Christ. We usually quote this verse at uh, the time of someone's death. They're between this idea of living and, and dying, and they recognize the gain. And I, I think that there is some applicational truth to that idea, but, but I, I, I'm not altogether certain that that's Paul's primary target. Paul literally means that his life is about just one thing, Christ. And he's pursuing him. It's reflected in Paul's prayer for them. It's reflected in Paul's testimony to them. And in verses 27 and verse 28, we discover a third truth here, and that is that that living our lives worthy of the gospel is reflected in Paul's expectations of them. Now look at these expectations. You'll see at the end of verse 27, I, I, I will hear about you that you are standing firm in one spirit, in one accord, that is, contending together for the faith of the gospel, not being frightened in any way by your opponents. It's similar to the prayer in verses 9 through 11 when we think about now what Paul's expectations for them are. We identify for ourselves this is what it means to live our lives for the sake of the gospel. To live in accord, to, to contending together for the gospel and not being frightened against those who oppose us. Just one thing. In summary, this is personal for Paul and has to be personal for us, for me, for me to live is Christ. In way of summary, this is priority for Paul. And it has to be priority for us. And in way of summary, this is a persevering work for Paul. He realizes that this is not his one-year mission in life. This is not just while he is in prison, but, but reflected here is that this is Paul's life. This is his mission. He recognizes that that will be his mission until Jesus calls him home. And here we are today, beginning a new semester, still in the midst of a new year. Could you hear the Lord say to us today, in the midst of everything that's going on in this world, just this one thing, pursue Christ, live your lives worthy of the gospel. It's what C.S. Lewis described, right? Mere Christianity. To the point that Christ says, give me your all. See, sometimes I'm afraid that we want to say, Jesus, I I'll give you my best. And yet we understand that Jesus has not called us to give him our 
best he has called us to give him our all, our all. So this is the way that Paul said it. Just one thing, only this, only this. But as we continue in this text, I think it's being faithful to this text in verse 29 and verse 30 that we note at least one other thing. And so if you will allow, let me just share one more thing. Just just one more thing. And it's an important matter, and that is that being citizens of heaven, and, and therefore living worthy of the gospel of Christ will put you in conflict with the world. Look at it again in verse 29 and verse 30. For it has been granted to you on Christ's behalf not only to believe in him, but also to suffer for him. And since you are engaged in the same struggle that you saw I had and now hear that I have. I know that he's preached in this campus, on this campus, Nick Ripken, a man that I've learned about in recent days and heard him speak back in November. If you're not familiar with Nick Ripken, he, I don't believe that's his real name, he, he says. He uses that name to protect those that he has ministered to and persecuted places of the world. And he has written The Insanity of God. And he has taken notes throughout his 30-year career among the persecuted church. And I heard him back in November over the course of a couple of days and three messages, I think it was. And upon my return home, one of my very best friends who was there also called me and said, man, I can't, I can't get off my mind, those, those messages. I said, me either. He said, what's the most memorable thing you said? I said, I'm not, sh- I'm not sure. There was so much. And my friend said, I'll tell you what, I, what it was for me. It's when he said, perhaps the question should not be, why are others persecuted? But perhaps the better question is, why are we not? You ever think about that? The question is not, why are people persecuted? Maybe we have to ask ourselves here in this country, why, why are we not? A couple of things come to my mind. First of all, I, I think the greater the persecution, the more counter-cultural we are. Maybe the reason that we don't face more persecution is that we are not counter-cultural enough. And, and of course, the second idea would be the more contra-Christ that people around us are, the more persecution we will face. This text tells us it's been granted to you on Christ's behalf not only to believe, but to suffer. But to suffer. Well, in my church, in order to be specific and make sure that I don't just give us a lesson, but if I, that I make specific points of application. I just come to the end of the message and ask the same question every week. So what? What do we do now? What do we do now? Let me give us a couple of things for us to do now. Number one, what steps, really just questions today, What steps will you take this year, this semester, to live worthy of the gospel of Christ? What steps will you take? Will you pursue him daily? 
Will you pursue Christ daily through his word, through fellowship with him in prayer, through the fellowship of the church and the accountability of the church and the teaching through the church? Will you pursue people with the gospel? What steps will you take this year to live worthy of the gospel of Christ? Could I, could I tell you one of your greatest temptations as a seminary student is going to be to have this faulty way of thinking that once I get out of seminary, I'll have more time. Yeah, newsflash here. You never get more than 24 hours a day and seven days a week. You have as much time right now as you're ever going to have to pursue him. What will you do this year to pursue Christ? The second question that I would leave us with this morning is perhaps the question is not what steps will I actively take, but maybe the question is what needs to be eliminated from my life in order to live worthy of the gospel of Jesus Christ? So for some of us, it may be things we need to add. For others, it may be things we need to subtract. But whatever the case, this one thing, pursue Christ. Perhaps you are thinking this morning that God has led you here to New Orleans to pursue a degree. And listen, With all of my heart, I want you to acquire a degree, but I want you to pursue Christ. For others of you that are nearing a point of graduation and moving beyond seminary, maybe you find yourself this morning pursuing a position. And listen, I believe that if God has called you and has equipped you, that God is is desiring to provide you a position of service and ministry to the kingdom. But could I ask us this morning not to pursue that position, but to pursue Christ. And there may be others of you today that really this morning find you wanting to pursue a lifetime spouse. And that is a good thing, the Bible says. But let me ask you today to pray and ask God to provide you that spouse, but to pursue him. Pursue him. Robert McFarlane was Ronald Reagan's national security advisor during the Reagan administration, a 20-year veteran of the Marine Corps. He was the architect of the Iran-Contra plan. Um, Some of you too young to know about what all of that is. So let me summarize that. It was a failure. And he was the architect of this failed plan. And when the plan failed, McFarland resigned his position as national security advisor, and he entered into a period of deep depression that threw Christ, his faith, he was able to come out of. And speaking a few years later at the National Prayer Breakfast, McFarland gave testimony of that and how the Lord brought him out of that. And he said that he had climbed the, quote, ladder to success, but got to the top and nothing was there. He continues, only after I fell off that ladder did I discover that I had it leaning against the wrong wall. Just because you're a seminary student, professor, pastor, doesn't mean that the enemy can't come into our path and cause us 
to pursue all the wrong things. And so I leave you where we started. Just one thing. Just one thing. Live your lives worthy of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Pursue him. Pursue him this year. Pursue him this semester. But pursue him this day, this day. Let's pray. Oh, Father, for these students, we pray. It's easy to get caught up into the trap of thinking that we are too busy to pursue you. To get caught by the trap to think that there are other matters that need our attention and thus lessen our pursuit of you. And so our simple prayer today, O oh God, is that you will show us the way by your Spirit to help us to pursue you today. Today. Bless these students. Bless these professors, administration. Lord, bless the New Orleans Baptist Theological Seminary that our greatest days may be ahead of us and that we will be known of a place of a people who pursue you. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. God bless you all. Thanks for being here today.